Welcome, uh, Mark Davids. Uh, which challenges are the Chinese economy facing? So the Chinese economy is facing challenges of partly its own making and partly to do with the resurgence of COVID, so particularly the Omicron variant. So if we take last year, last year was the year that China had recovered from COVID. Remember, China was the first country to exit COVID in 2020. They contained it very well. It was something the Chinese were very, very proud of and the economy opened up much quicker than the rest of the world. So there was an early cyclical recovery. Then in 2021, they took this opportunity to catch up on reform and regulation. And this had a dampening effect on growth and corporate profits, particularly in the property sector, which was the most impacted, where the authorities have clearly tried to wean the sector off growth fueled by debt and they've restricted credit flowing to the stocks with the worst balance sheets. And that's had big knock-on effects, obviously, on the outlook for property and peripheral sectors as well. And then in regulation, very broadly across a wide number of areas, from gaming to e-commerce to food delivery to education, um, all these things have you know, arguably been sensible regulations and not dissimilar to the kind of regulations we've seen in Europe or the US surrounding data security, minimum wages, treatment of gig economy workers. But it's been done in a particularly ad hoc, aggressive way that scared investors and depressed growth in, in a lot of these areas. So those have been the big challenges to lighten up on, on those man-made downward pressures on growth and allow growth to pick up this year, which is a really important political year for China because Xi Jinping obviously hopes to get his third term in October, November. So the playbook as we see it was that these man-made pressures on growth would mitigate this year and stimulus would follow, growth would pick up and lead us into the party Congress in October. Instead, what we've had is a resurgence in COVID via Omicron, um, which has complicated the issue. Yeah, but so, so based on where the Chinese economy is today, can it recover and when and how? So the big question is, will the Omicron virus be contained? And without knowing that, it's impossible to say when they're going to recover, but the intention is clearly to stabilize infections at a base rate. We, we subtly moved last year from zero COVID to dynamic zero COVID, which I suppose was a, da a tacit admission that um, you will never get to zero COVID. But the way they're dealing with it is mass testing um, and then the use of technology to do very targeted lockdowns. And if you look at the different lockdowns they've had in China, you've had from the beginning of this year, you had Xi'an, which lasted about three weeks. Then you had Shenzhen, which lasted only four days. Um, so they had quite a lot of confidence that they could handle these things. But then, of course, Shanghai was the big disaster, where you had two months of very, very strict lockdown with huge negative repercussions for growth, um, global supply chains, um, and all that. Yeah. But so you're stationed in Hong Kong, which I know has had the uh, different restrictions uh, than mainland China. But, you know, looking at the history of this spring, would you say that China will change how they handle uh, COVID also then based on the fact what we're seeing in the economy at the moment? So China is not going to change their approach. They are particularly committed to dynamic zero COVID. This is a political choice and it's not going to change probably until next year after Xi Jinping's third term, um, perhaps till after the introduction of an mRNA vaccine that's made in China. Um, so the intention at the moment, I think, is to keep infection levels under control and stimulate the economy from here so that growth into the second half accelerates into the party congress. Okay. So with all this in mind, in terms of investment, how do you reason now? Well, there are some 
big opportunities, particularly in China right now. So I think it's important to remember as investors that nothing is, you know, in China, it's never as good as you think it is. It's never as bad as you think it is. So you get this big pendulum of, um, of sentiment and we go from very bullish to, to, to very bearish. And at the moment, clearly we're in the bearish camp, valuations are at multi-year lows. Um, the price to book on the MSCI China index is hovering just above one. So it's kind of where, where the lows were back in 2015 and back in 2009, shortly after recovery from the financial crisis. So sentiment clearly depressed, people using words like uninvestable to describe China, which to my mind always you know, it signals an opportunity when people are thinking like that. So some of these big Chinese platform tech stocks, the e-commerce names, um, wh which have been particularly beaten up on sentiment, on multiple um, compression, on fears about regulation, we're now seeing evidence that despite 80% share price falls in some cases, the actual operating fundamentals of these businesses are actually doing fine. You know, these, these businesses will still be in business in 10 years' time, but you're not paying the kinds of multiples at the moment that suggest that's the case. So I think there are opportunities there. Um, there are opportunities in areas that are more traditionally linked to economic stimulus. So maybe not the property companies directly, but some of the peripheral areas like um, glass, cement, um, or interestingly, renewables, so a lot of the stimulus this time we think is going to go towards reforming the grid for renewable energy, um, solar, wind, um, all these areas where there is capacity to invest more rather than in bridges and subways and buildings. Because I was just about to ask, like normally you would see a uh, stimulus going towards infrastructure. Yeah, and, and I think you're going to see it again but it's going to be more targeted and it will have definitely a more renewable focus to it. Okay. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, at the beginning of our uh, chat or this interview, uh, the regulations and because here in Sweden, it's often described as quite aggressive, but you see it more as something necessary, if, if I understand you right. Well, I, I, I think it is necessary in some degree. You know, these were areas that grew extremely quickly. And with a lot of innovation and a lot of technological advancement, the market moves ahead of the ability of politicians and regulators to, to, to catch up. So there's this, there's this attempt to match the regulatory framework to the current reality. And with something like Alibaba and the Ant Financial IPO, clearly at the cusp of that IPO, which was obviously pulled at the last minute, the Chinese authorities became aware that Ant Financial was operating in areas that arguably it shouldn't have been operating according to their regulatory framework. So the kinds of products they were selling, the, the size of, you know, the, the, the tentacles they had in, in all sorts of different parts of the financial sector. And that worried um, the party and obviously the party is all about control and what we're seeing now is a reimposing of control over areas of the economy over areas of society that um, had um, had clearly moved a bit too quickly so some of it I think is very common or in you know these these things are subjects that the European regulators the US regulators Chinese regulators find common ground with. Some of it is more specifically about the Communist Party and control. And uh, with all of this in mind, do you have any top holdings? Yes, so within Chinese e-commerce space, we have um, a large holding in JD.com, which I think is the company that has most effectively dealt with the pandemic and the aftermath. So what they did was they invested a lot of money in their own logistics and their own fulfillment, um, much like Amazon, rather than a more decentralized um, outsourced model like Alibaba. Um, and we were skeptical for a for number of years because we thought this kind of investment is huge. Will they ever make a return on it? But the evidence now suggests that actually it has been worthwhile 
and they are a more efficient and effective um, company and more trusted by consumers as a result of their ability to, to fulfill. Uh, other areas, we still have big exposure to TSMC, um, you know, still the, you know, the by far the leading logic foundry in, the, in semiconductor space in the world. Um, the technological lead they have over competitors from Samsung to Intel, let alone Chinese companies trying to catch up, um, you know, they, are, they, are, they remain years ahead. And structurally, this is still an area where all the products we buy um, in the future will have just more semiconductors um, in them than, than in the past. Uh, and then we're, we're very keen on financials as, as a theme in Asia. And unlike developed markets, um, a lot of the emerging market financials in Asia are genuine structural growth opportunities with you know, much, much wider margins, better return on assets, better balance sheets, and a population that is underbanked and populations where financial products are still relatively immature. So you've, you see a very long runway for growth in markets like Indonesia, where we own Bank Central Asia, in markets like India, where we own banks like Kotak Mahindra. Um, there's there's you know, multi-year growth opportunities ahead there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mark Davids, for being here. Thank you very much.